Hey everybody, I'm Hugh Brownstone for Three Blind Men and an Elephant, and yeah, you read that right. I'm saying the Sony a7R 3 is so brilliant that it no longer makes sense to think of it simply as a full-frame camera, and clearly I'm saying a whole bunch more. But before I go into the full rationale for what I suspect may make some folks annoyed and lead other folks to be roll on the floor, laugh my ass off dismissive, Let's take a look at this two or three minute compendium we pulled together of our time with the a7R 3 and a bunch of glass out of the Sony press event in Sedona, Arizona last week, looking at everything from stills to slow motion video. Now, in order to do that, let me just set up what you're about to see this way. Not only did we want to explore what the camera can do, I quickly realized that something extraordinary was happening to me out in the desert. The quality of the imagery was so high that I felt the weight of perfection just lift from me completely. And in the opening moments of this footage, I reveled in forgetting about perfection in the pursuit of storytelling. Call it a Sedona meets the Sopranos homage. Check it out. A7R3 blows me away. Image quality of the glass we used blows me away. Autofocus speed and accuracy are excellent, though, as I keep saying, they are not perfect. Ditto burst rates and video. They're outstanding, but there are cameras out there that can do any one of these things better. On the other hand, I don't believe there is a camera out there as capable across the board for anything I might do. So, first, I'm saying that the differences among a Sony 42.4, 50, or 51 megapixel and a Tower Jazz 47.5 megapixel sensor, like the ones using the A7R3, Hasselblad X1D, H60 50C, uh, Fuji GFX 50S, uh, Pentax 645Z, and Nikon D850 respectively, should not be the primary basis for choosing among these cameras 99% of the time for 99% of us. The Perceptible differences in resolution, color depth, dynamic range, and high ISO performance are so small or significant so infrequently that other factors like ergonomics, lens selection, operational speed and reliability, price, size, weight, workflow, customer support, and yeah, video performance are more important. 
And sure, I know the A7R3 sensor is the same one as that found in the A7R2. And I know that dimensionally larger medium format sensors with larger pixel pitch take in more light, allowing one to operate, all else being equal, with wider dynamic range and lower noise. But after two days and nights of shooting almost continuously with the A7R3, using a pile of glass, Sony's 35 1.4 Distagon, the 12 to 24 F4, the new 24 to 105 F4, and the 100 to 400 uh, G Master, and already being familiar with Sony's other G Masters, the 24 to 72.8, 7200 2.8, 85 1.4, and the previous A7R2, I'm also saying that the updated A7R3, with a lens ecosystem that has expanded significantly over the two years since the introduction of the A7R3 II, are, for the vast majority of us, not just in the same class as today's digital medium format cameras, but in fact a superior set of tools with a superior return on investment where medium format performance is required. Even if pixel shifting in my small test didn't reveal much difference, though I acknowledge I should have used a heavier duty tripod, I will look at it again. And it's clear that this kind of technology is ideally suited not just to architecture or fabrics, but I think most especially for museum quality art cataloging, which I think is the perfect application for a high resolution medium format camera. Even if the IBIS is still not class leading, uh, oh, wait a minute, in traditionally defined medium format, it's unmatched. Even if a tilty screen is not the same as a waist level or angle finder, the absences of which continue to annoy the heck out of me. Though the small HD focus is a tantalizing alternative which arrived too late for me to check out in this setting, but I'll be reviewing that separately, so stay tuned. Even if the A7R3 shoots 14-bit RAW rather than the few medium format cameras that can shoot 16-bit. Even if the lenses are not without issues, but what lenses aren't? Let's talk about this for a moment because when it comes to medium format, those incredible and incredibly expensive medium format lenses are a huge draw. And it's important to ask, how much better are they than what you can get on the Sony? The 35 1.4, for example, which to my astonishment, I loved and spent more time with than any other lens. I mean, I don't even like 35 millimeter field of view had more chromatic aberration than I'd like. Easy to correct for stills, not so for video, but oh God, the sharpness, punch, and that 1.4 depth of field. The 12 to 24, my second most used optic and a new favorite, had more distortion and was softer at the edge than I'd anticipated, while the maximum F4 was slow for my taste, but oh, that field of view. I suppose. If you wanted to, you could argue that Sony, even today, does not have the catalog of fast, tack-sharp, distortion-free, and rich primes that medium format shooters demand and are used to. Or you could argue that Sony full-frame lenses are already faster and as good or better than what medium format shooters are used to, and there are more of them than you might have thought. Speed. Well, Fuji's 45mm f2.8, to take just one example, is the full-frame equivalent of a 35mm f2.2. The Pentax 55 2.8 is the full-frame equivalent of a 43mm 2.2. Are medium format lenses like these sharper and better corrected than the latest Sony's? I'm just not sure. I mean, my recent return to medium format consisted of using a vintage Mamiya RB67 and a 90mm f3.8 for an afternoon, and I still haven't had time to examine the images closely. My last experience with medium format before that was a decade and a half ago with the Contax 645 and the 80mm F2, which were breathtaking. But I just don't know what would happen if I put images from these cameras side by side. Maybe I'll just have to spend more time mucking about in medium format. Although even if we were to presuppose, for argument's sake, that medium format lenses are optically superior, I'll assert that, right, 
99% of us, 99% of the time, the difference is too imperceptible to matter. That's because the lenses for the A7R3, in addition to the lenses I've already mentioned, uh, things like the Sony Zeiss 55 1.8 sonar and 51.4 planar to the latest Zeiss Batis 18 2.8, 25.2.0 and 135.2.8 are all simply astounding. Even the relatively modestly priced, well, $1,300 is relative, right? 24 to 105 f4 was so good that it is now likely the next lens we will buy for our Sony kit ahead of the 70 to 200 f4. So, if the lenses for the a7R3 are almost as good or possibly better because, hey, they're employing the latest designs, the latest manufacturing techniques, and building upon everything that has come before them, what else might you really want other than a super wide prime? Maybe a super telephoto, even if medium format cameras don't really have them anyway? Uh, something like a 400 millimeter f2.8 for sports and wildlife shooters who therefore wouldn't use medium format anyway? Well, in any case, it's coming. But there are other things the A7R3 revealed to us in the Sonoran Desert. The sensor is so close to the flange that I got more dust and spittle on it as I changed lenses and like an idiot just blew on it to clear it in two days than I have in, I don't know, almost 50 years of using interchangeable lens cameras, but hey, Sonoran Desert dust is special and I don't know, maybe the sun baked my brain a little bit. I'm not sure how much lighter an A7R3 field kit with lenses is than a medium format setup because with the rare exception of something like that 55 1.8 sonar, Sony's best full frame lenses are big and heavy. To my amazement, I found out the hard way in the field as we were setting up that the A7R3 doesn't have an intervalometer. Shout out to Drew Garassi. Uh, thanks again, Drew, for lending me yours. Even the improved ergos and menu system remain maddeningly complex and cumbersome, especially when you're under pressure to get the shot, at least until you spend enough time with the camera to customize it to your preferences. Although, okay, let, let's face it. Even then, they're still maddeningly complex, not holding a candle to the ergos and software of an admittedly simpler Hasselblad H6D or X1D. You know what would be nice? Lit buttons that could be programmed to display what they actually are. Maybe even something like Apple's context-dependent touch bar. Though, yeah, right, they'd accelerate the battery drain. Even so, what would be great in any case is the ability to rearrange icons and menu structures in a Mac or PC-based app where it belongs, which could then be downloaded to the camera. Until then, operationally, the Sony reminds me of nothing so much as a 1980s era HP 41C programmable calculator. Brilliantly capable, horrible to program. Though to be fair, I did learn how to shift from 24 frames per second 4K to 120 frames per second full HD with just one click of the top plate dial. And I did learn how to map, because it's now possible, the video record button to the regular shutter release. Yay, there's hope. Or as my father used to say, one foot in front of the other. And the rear LCD panel, when you set it to sunny, is much more visible than the one on the A6500. Now, back inside, out of the sun, it is incontrovertible to me that the A7R III outperforms traditionally defined medium format cameras in profound ways that matter to high-end photographers and is coming up to speed, sometimes, where it does not. I still can't get out of my head, for example, the experience I had back in New York of photographing dancers at 10 frames per second and having the A7R III wirelessly triggering a pro photo firing at 10 frames per Per second, having photographed dancers mid-flight before, it haunts me in a good way. Traditionally defined medium format can't touch that. I didn't have uh, time to try the tethering app, but this is actually a big deal for just this kind of studio-based work, along with portraiture and product shots. Hey, it's even great for vloggers 
So I'm looking forward to going hands-on with it. Speaking of portraiture, the A7R3's iFocus is brilliant. I don't know of a medium format camera that can touch that either. And 15 stops of dynamic range? Even Hasselblad doesn't make that claim for its H6050C. You have to go to the 100 for that. In an age of rising demand for video and computationally rich imaging, let's just say traditionally defined medium format cameras can't touch even the A7R3's basic autofocus and stills, let alone video. Though, when it comes to video more generally, well, there's no comparison at all. The A7R3 smokes them, even if it's limited to 8-bit 420 in 30 minutes, which really won't matter to anyone except documentarians, broadcasters, and filmmakers expecting to display their work where the difference can be seen and appreciated by the audience. And guys like me who prattle on for more than 30 minutes in a situation like this. Then again, I don't know anyone who uses a traditionally defined medium format camera for video, but of course this will change. And while a big benefit of medium format cameras, going back to the days of film, was the dramatically larger viewing area than what we now call full frame, 35 millimeter, the A7R3's EVF, to my eye, is as large or larger and even more legible than the one found in, say, the Hasselblad X1D, which would make sense since the A7R3 now sports the same 3.6 million dot EVF uh, as in the A9 compared to 2.4 million dot EVF in the X1D. Even the Fuji, the GFX50S EVF, while matching the 3.6 million dots of the A7R3, doesn't exceed it. Though I do love the fact that with an adapter, it can tilt and swivel. But in all of this discussion of camera bodies and lenses, Sedona reminded me once again of what professional medium format shooters, professional shooters of all stripes, know especially well and do anyway. You always want to light the heck out of whatever you're shooting in even broad daylight, not only so you can use base ISO, but to reduce dynamic range demands on the sensor. You need to have a unique and compelling vision, which is best realized with that kind of performance and effort. And you're going to have to spend a chunk of time in post to bring out the full potential of the images you capture. Thus, Sedona also taught me, again, for me, your mileage may vary, that post now especially, means moving to Capture One Pro, which just knocked my socks off. And it taught me, okay, reaffirmed to me, that my mid-2012 15-inch MacBook Pro really is getting too old for editing the output from a camera like the A7R III, stills and video alike. But I was fortunate enough to be carrying a 2-terabyte Glyph Atom Raid SSD, which, even saddled with a USB 2.0 connection, matched my internal one terabyte SSD performance at just over 400 megabytes per second read and write. But hold both of these thoughts though, because yes, I'll cover each separately in future videos. One other thing, by changing the implicit rules and naming the A7R3 medium format camera of the year, medium format being a rarefied category to begin with, I'm also implying, though since I'm explaining this to you out loud, I guess I'm explicitly stating that for most of us, most of the time, crop sensor cameras and optics, APS-C and yeah, micro four thirds are actually better options than full frame cameras. It was fascinating, for example, to see just how stellar the image quality was when we put the 24 to 105 F4 onto our A6300. The magic still happens in all but the largest print sizes, or not even then, perhaps, depending on viewing distance, medium, and audience. I can tell you that at 13 by 19, the print of this image Claudia shot is just incredible. I mean, I, 4K does not give it uh, justice. Because it so fully embraces the three blind men and an elephant ethos of authenticity, humanity, and wit, and knowing how good that sensor is, we'll be putting a print of it at least four times the size up on one of our walls. Which leads us into a deeper reflection upon why I conceptualize the A7R3 as a much refined, operationally superior A7R2 
that has redefined the relatively new yet still traditional boundaries of full frame and medium frame, uh, medium format digital cameras. And why I think this is critical to understanding the A7R3's value and role. Now, as I said back a few minutes, unlike two years ago when Sony launched the A7R2 and A7S2, the Sony FE mount lens ecosystem is now much richer. The G Master series matches or exceeds focal length for focal length, aperture for aperture, the performance of Canon's and Nikon's best professional workhorse zooms, you know, the 16 to 35, 24 to 70, and 70 to 200 2.8s. It now also has that 100 to 400. And as I mentioned earlier, what I already considered to be the legendary 85 1.4. Some of their non-G Master glasses also superb, like the 90mm 2.8 macro. And as I also mentioned, Zeiss has introduced additional stellar full-frame primes in native Sony E-mount. But these are all as or more expensive than their Canon and Nikon counterparts, while Sigma's outstanding and more moderately priced art lenses are, for the moment, only available via their MC11 or similar, you know, Metabones adapter. So, the irony, at least in my book, is that in 2017, it's no longer just or even primarily about the camera bodies. It's about whether or not you want to buy into the Sony full-frame lens system. Otherwise, what's the point? And when you do that, everything gets very, very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can adapt just about any lens because of the short flange distance, but the simple fact is that if you're interested in the A7R 3 for all it can do, which includes speed, you have to recognize that you can't get ultimate AF speed with non-native glass. I don't care what anybody says. So let's talk some dollars. Figure an A7R 3 body for $3,200, along with the three workhorse primes, probably the 85 1.4, uh, the 35 1.4, maybe the 55 1.8 or 50 1.4, the planar, perhaps the baddest 25 millimeter F2. You're talking about 14 grand all in, which is a pile of money, medium format sized money, and very similar to the kit I used for many years with my Canons, starting with the EOS 3 and ending with the 5D Mark II using mostly L glass. But medium format sized money for just a body, or maybe a body and one or two lenses. A Hasselblad H6050C body will set you back 14,500 bucks. The X1D with 45mm f3.5, the full frame equivalent of a 35mm f2.7, will cost you $13,400. Yeah, the Fuji and Pentax bodies are less expensive than the Hassies at $6,500 and $5,500 respectively, but each is still thousands more than the A7R3. Though, interestingly enough, the Fuji and Pentax lenses are generally not as expensive as Sony's best. Certainly not heavier. Though, in any event, Fuji and Pentax don't have many lenses. There just aren't many of them. Ditto for the X1D. In this context, given the Sony's massive capabilities, the A7R3 and lens design are a steal. Fidgety menus and controls notwithstanding. All of which may mean nothing to medium format devotees, and I understand. When you find a tool that works for you, you stay with it. Change for change's sake is not a solid business rationale, especially if you've already amortized the cost of your kit and there's nothing your system won't let you do. Even more, there is something very compelling about using a tool designed from the ground up for one purpose only, with nary an FN or C button in sight. Well, back to the X1D, it does in fact have a C1 through C3 uh, nomenclature on its top dial. But here's the rub from the other side, which I find fascinating. When you look at that same $14,000 Sony full frame price tag and compare it to, say, the uh, 24 megapixel censored APS-C sized Fuji X-T2 with a comparable set of primes and zooms that comes in for 6,000 less, just about 8,000 all in, offering the same field of view and speed. Well, even if the Fuji kit doesn't offer as shallow a depth of field at all focal lengths, nor ultimate resolving power, nor quite the same autofocus or video capabilities. They're closer than you might think. It is still magnificent in its own right. It is dramatically easier to use. Those jewel-like primes are smaller and lighter, but just as gorgeous, and some of them even have hard stops. 
It's difficult, if not impossible, to distinguish images shot with this gear from higher megapixel images when displayed and viewed at normal sizes, media, and distances. And yeah, I understand. There are perceptible differences in perspective, even at equivalent fields of view. But six grand, man, that's a bucket full of money for travel, paying off credit card bills, saving up for a wedding. And while I would have compared the Sony a6300 or a6500 to the a7R3 instead of the Fuji, and I have in previous reviews that you can find, there's very little point because for ultimate image quality, you'd still be relying on Sony's full-frame glass until and if Sony decides to round out their crop sensor lens line, which I just don't see happening. Really, this is just like the medium format versus full-frame discussion playing out all over again, the one we've just been having. One step down in the food chain. And one step further down from that, it's crop sensor cameras versus one inch censored bridge cameras, then one inch versus smartphone, but these are other conversations for other times. Let's get back to the A7R three and wrap it up like this. I think it's fair to say that the A7R three is a penultimate resolution, stills first hybrid camera with what at this stage I'll assert is a complete lens lineup and an extraordinary complement of software-driven electronics, from pixel shifting to IAF to excellent 4K video and full HD 120 frames per second slow motion and more. Its small and still fidgety body does, however, belie its capabilities. In fact, you can say that in keeping with Sony's clear commitment to continuous improvement and rapid in-market testing. These are all good things in my book. Of course, it's not as finished a product as you might want if you were determined to make it the last camera you buy for five or 10 years. Even so, its image quality matches all but the very pinnacle of medium format cameras and its electronics and video capabilities smoke everything, everything in the class, as well as blows away all of them on value. If you have the skill, clients, display size, display medium, viewing distances, ambition, a real but limited budget, and can live with the ergos, the Sony a7R three with its lens ecosystem is extraordinary and truly worthy, when you think about it enough, to be given the title of 2017 medium format camera of the year. Or not. I'd love to see your thoughts in the comments section below. Now, I want to give a special shout out to the Sony team for putting on this event, getting us there and back without incident. They did cover travel and accommodations, and as always, encouraging us to fully speak our minds, which I think I just did. If you like what you've seen here today, please, give a thumbs up, subscribe, join the conversation below. And especially this time of year, it really helps when you support our work by remembering to use our no cost to you affiliate links, or even making a contribution directly via the PayPal link in the show more section below. As always, uh, and in all cases, we thank you for it. For Three Blind Men and an Elephant, I'm Hugh Brownstone. See you next time and happy shooting.